Thank you for hanging in there. This promises to be an exciting session. Um, the session is on nanomedicine, and I'm Sangeeta Bhatia. I'm a faculty member in the Koch Institute, and I so happen to be running the Marble Center for Cancer Nanomedicine here at MIT. Um, you can see a snapshot of it here, and you can check us out online. <laughs> and um, what I want to say is that this session, I think, is, I think, really exciting and timely, um, and it kind of explores the, the potential of this emerging nanoscale science, the biology and physics that happen at the nanoscale, and how they can really help us address some of the grand challenges in cancer, prevention, detection, monitoring, and treatment. And so you're gonna hear four wonderful vignettes um, at this kind of interface. And this is actually a teaser for next year, because next year, on June 15th, we're gonna have the whole symposium on nanomedicine. So you consider yourselves primed. <laughs> Um, so uh, to get us started, uh, we have Jim Collins. Uh, Jim is the Tremere Professor of Medical Engineering and Science, Professor of Biological Engineering, and a colleague of mine in the Institute for Medical Engineering and Science. He's also a core founding faculty member of the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard, and an institute member of the Broad. He really helped to pioneer the area of synthetic biology um, and also systems biology. And we were just talking about the National Academies. Um, he's uh, actually one of several people you're going to hear from this afternoon, but a rare group um, who's been elected to all three. So welcome, Jim. Thanks, <laughs> well, thanks, Sangeeta. Uh, I want to start by thanking Phil and Susan for the invitation to speak to you today about uh, what we're doing in synthetic biology. So what is this? This is a relatively new field really a field that really captures the spirit of convergence that's bringing together engineers and physicists along with molecular biologists to model, design, and build synthetic gene circuits and other biomolecular components and to use these to rewire living cells for a variety of functions. And what I'm going to do is touch upon briefly how the field is beginning to impact diagnostics, including cancer diagnostics. Well, the field started about 16, 17 years ago when several groups, including our own, recognized that one could take an engineering approach in molecular biology. So just as an electrical engineer might come up with a circuit schematic and begin by mathematically modeling it, we and other groups recognize you could do the same now with wet biological circuits. So one could envision now wiring together components and whereas an electrical engineer would go search out for electronic components, be they resistors, capacitors, inductors, and using soldering to breadboard it into the circuit, we recognize you could go find genes, promoters, other bits of DNA, terminators, RNA, proteins, and use the tools of modern biotechnology to put them together into plasmids or constructs and to introduce these into living cells, again, to reprogram them for a variety of purposes. The field, and specifically now, these reprogrammed cells are really beginning to touch upon a number of different applications worldwide. The area that we're most interested in is in medicine and global health. And there are now a lot of many, many exciting efforts, including from Sangeeta's group and my group and others, on creating living cells that could serve as living diagnostics and living therapeutics. I'm not going to talk to you about that today. And instead, talk to you about a new emerging area where many of you can recognize that you don't want a living cell in certain settings, whether it be a doctor's office, out in the field, or in a hospital. And we got excited about thinking about, well, how could you do that? How could you nonetheless harness the power and diversity of biology without using a living cell. And Keith Pardee, very talented, who was then a postdoc in my lab, began to think about what could you do with cell-free extracts. So what are these? These are where you can basically open up a living cell and take the machine of the cell outside of the cell. So this would consist of a few dozen enzymes. You'd have nucleic acids, DNA, RNA, and you have marvelous molecular machines like ribosomes. And these cell-free extracts have been used for decades in molecular biology labs. Keith sat back and got intrigued by the possibility, well, what else could you do with this? So what Keith did was he tried seeing what happens if you spot this on paper and freeze dry it. Would it still be functional? So what he found was that he could freeze dry it and then sometime later rehydrate it and what he spotted on paper actually was functional. It behaved as if it was still inside a living cell. And so here's output where he showed he could actually just introduce a very simple circuit that would express a fluorescent protein. So what did he do next? Well, Keith came in and for those of you who play with self-reactions, you know you'll typically have to take them out of your large freezer in your lab. So Keith tested, as shown here on the left, what happens when you go from fresh from frozen stock 
to now the freeze drying process, do you lose any activity? And he found, no, you don't lose any activity, in fact. He then did a very anecdotal informal experiment where he made many different spots on paper, just shoved it in his desk drawer in the lab at the Vs, and about once a month took them out and looked to see was there loss of activity and found over the course of half a year now, well past a year, little if any loss of activity when they stored these at room temperature. So could you now do something more than just constitutively expressing GFP? Well, in our lab, we, among other things, will design circuits and components that, for example, could be used as sensors. And Alex Green, who is a postdoc in our lab, along with Peng Yin at the V's, developed toehole switches that could serve as sensors for different RNA. And these are captured in the upper corner of this slide, where what you have is basically a repressed mRNA component, where the repression comes from this stem structure that can actually be engineered to be opened up to any RNA sequence of interest. And we initially designed this to serve as living arrays inside bacterial cells. We would report on dozens of different transcripts that they reported or detected at the same time. Keith and Alex first tried to see could these actually function with freeze drying, and it worked beautifully. They could design dozens, if not hundreds, of these that could be freeze dried and function on paper. Initially, they did it with fluorescent proteins. But if you can envision using this out in the field, whether in the developing world or at home or in other settings, you really don't want to have to have a plate reader or fluorimeter to look at a fluorescent output. So what Keith and Alex did was then replace fluorescent protein with LAC-Z. So LAC-Z, if present with another enzyme, which we could put in the substrate in the paper, if expressed, will cleave the other enzyme and actually change the color from yellow to purple. So what now they were able to do was, on paper, not have a fluorescent readup, but a color change. So that if their RNA-based sensor detected the RNA of interest, it would actually change the color of the paper within about 20 to 25 minutes. At the VIS, which specializes in tech transfer of biotech notions, Keith, working with Tom Ferran, actually developed a protocol where they could print arrays of these just from a computer printer, and then actually spot then the self reactrex freeze dried appropriately, and produce now, very inexpensively, for really pennies per sensor, paper-based arrays that could be used for a variety of either research purposes or clinical diagnostics. With Tom leading the effort, the team also developed a very inexpensive plate reader. In this case, really, it's a more electronic reader, not a plate reader, where you could take arrays of these paper-based sensors, place it in, and just use an LED to shine a light through, where you can now quantify the color change. And this thing only cost about 35 bucks, so for about the cost of a cup of coffee here in Boston, you can now have an electronic reader <laughs> that could quantify your output and send the signal out of your PC or your smartphone. We got excited in my lab. Among other things, we work on antibiotic resistance with Graham Walker, who's a great friend here in the biology department. And one of the challenges in antibiotic resistance is can you get rapid diagnostics? So if you're in an accident and you show up in an emergency room and you have an injury, a wound, they're actually going to load you up on antibiotics very quickly. They're going to sample your wound, send it out to the lab, and one to three days later come back to tell you, do you have a bacterial infection and what's the most appropriate antibiotic? They'll have hedged their bet by giving you both probably a broad spectrum antibiotic against a gram negative and a broad spectrum against gram positive without knowledge of what you have or if it's resistant. What Keith was able to show and do was rapidly develop a number of different RNA-based sensors on these toehole switches to detect different mRNAs associated with antibiotic resistance. In this case, four different ones that he just developed super quickly, basically resistant against spectinomycin, chlorophenicol, canamycin, and ampicillin, four very popular antibiotics, and could show that you could take the sample without need to culture the bugs, but actually just lice what's present and quickly, within about 20 to 25 minutes, detect the RNA that's present in the sample. We were excited about presenting this and submitting it for publication in late summer 2014 based on this and other efforts, but actually stopped just before we sent it in when Keith and Alex came to my office. So back in late August 2014, it was at the height of the Ebola crisis. And Keith and Alex says, Jim, we want to see if we can use our platform to quickly develop a diagnostic platform that may be relevant to the crisis. And what these guys did was remarkable. In under 12 hours, they developed 24 different senses for Ebola. Not only did they design it, they developed it, tested it, and validated it in half a day. So what did they do? They basically identified one of the nuclear uh, protein mRNAs from the virus, and on it used a bioinformatics software developed in our lab to identify 12 different regions that could serve as triggers for these toehole sensors. They did 12 for the Sudan train, 12 for the Zaire strain. They used only about $20 worth of DNA material. So you now think about the time that it often takes to develop an antibody-based diagnostic test. 
as well as the cost. Here these guys are doing it in basically a day and with $20 of material. And in this case, they actually could quickly and beautifully develop readout using these paper-based sensors. They could also go as further to actually discriminate between the Sudan and the Zaire strains. So in this area of SynBio, I think, again, a really good example of convergence, what do we have? Well, what we have is now this new platform that eliminates the cold chain from taking advantage of, the, again, the power and diversity of biology. And that here, these things are very stable at room temperature. You can take the sensors, stick them in your pocket, go on a plane around the world, take them out of your pocket and use them. You can stick them in a regular envelope, send it around the world, store it at a doctor's office or in your desk, and some a year later use it. It's also incredibly cheap. So if we use the Cadillac versions of the self reactrix some of which you could buy from vendors that are sponsoring our meeting today, it's still under a buck per sensor. Using homegrown self reactrix we're now down to two cents per sensor. So as we think about Tyler's challenge to us of could we readily detect and monitor and, and ch chart somebody's disease progression, you know, it's in our country where it's expensive, no question, but we have third party payers, it's okay maybe to be a little expensive, but in many other parts of the world, it'd be great if you could do this inexpensively and quickly, and we think we've got a platform that can speak to that. Further, we've got a colorimetric output, so now something as simple or equivalent to a pregnancy test can be extended in many other conditions. And beyond just this lag C, we now have many, many different encodable dyes as part of our platform, and have coupled it with uh, this very simple optical reader. Where I'm going to share a few anecdotes, including now very merging efforts on ours relevant to cancer. But before that, I want to share one of my prouder moments as an academic, and that's how our team responded to the Zika crisis. So in late January of 2016, many of us in the room received an email from MIT leadership asking us who was working on Zika, as there was an interest in trying to organize efforts on campus to address what was then a really burgeoning crisis. We were not working on Zika at the time, and I'd only really become somewhat aware of it due to articles in the New York Times that prior week. I called up Keith, who was now then a professor at University of Toronto, and I called up Alex, who's a professor at Arizona State University, and said, what do you think? And he says, yes, let's go after this. I think the platform's relevant. I turned to then five or six young folks in my lab, postdocs and grad students, they said, Jim, we'd really love to do this. And to their credit, this team across multiple institutions dropped what they were doing and turned to the crisis. And to just capture what they did briefly as the team developed about four different, di different sensors for Zika, improving the design of the toehole switch, and by improving what they did was basically tighten the off so that you would not trigger it uh, without the RNA that you were going after, and increase the on so your dynamic range improved. Further, in the midst of this, we benefit from Melina Fan, who was one of the founders of AdGene, this marvelous repository for plasmids that many of us use, was doing a brief sabbatical in my lab. And Melina was looking at NASBA, which is an isothermal nucleic acid amplification scheme, to see if you could freeze dry this. And what Molina was able to do was show you could freeze dry. So now begin to think about applying it as part of a one-pot reaction in this paper-based scheme. What I hadn't shared was on the Ebola effort that our sensors at the time could detect in the low nanomolar range, so 10 to the minus 9. That's not good enough for most clinical applications, including Ebola. In the interim, up until early 2016, when we turned to this, we got down to the low picomolar, which actually was good enough for something like Ebola, but not good enough for Zika. What we found, though, is when we actually implemented this now freeze-dried NASBA, isothermal, so you don't have to go through your PCR thermal cycling, we could actually get into the very low femtomolar region, which, in fact, is exactly where you need to be for Zika. So what do we do? Well, we teamed up with Lee Gerke, who's a colleague of mine in Sengitis at IMES, and Lee's one of our world's experts in global health viral analyses, and he had Zika from the original outbreak in 1947, and he had dengue. And we were able to spike these into samples, and it's captured here, we could actually now use this to detect in the low femtomolar region and differentiate Zika from dengue. This is now around April of 2016. There were little, if any, human samples available in the US to test. We scrambled, went and called everybody we could. We're preparing to send our MIT grad students down to Colombia and Brazil to get samples and run tests on site when we actually reached out to David O'Connor from the University of Wisconsin, who was not working on humans, but infected monkeys. And to David's credit, 30 seconds later, he wrote back and said, I'd love to work with you guys. And he sent us samples of monkeys, which are captured at the bottom of this slide, where we show we now, in two and a half femtomolar, in basically, in this case, a clinical sample, it's a monkey clinical sample, could get a readout in a matter of minutes. Where else did we go? Well, again, we benefited uh, just by chance from a really talented young person, Guillaume Lambert, who was a visiting postdoc, just about to start his faculty career at Cornell. 
And Guillaume had the idea of using CRISPR as a diagnostic component. And briefly, his notion was, could you use CRISPR-Cas9 to discriminate between different strains of viruses? So could you identify strain-specific SNPs that would be found in PAM sequences? And so the design here is basically a double negative. But what he said was, OK, if I have strain A, an African strain, and an Asian strain, and strain, the African strain has a certain SNP in the PAM sequence, if I could design now the trigger for the toehole sensor around that, if I express Cas9 on it, then it should cut that, and now you won't get the trigger. Okay, so you would have the double negative. You would have no pickup on that, and that would identify it as strain A or the African strain, whereas the other would be the American strain. Well, it turns out this could work brilliantly and work brilliantly. What Guillaume was able to do was now show you could do a two-step. First, identify do you have Zika, so differentiate Zika from other fever viruses, including dengue. And then now you can go in and use the CRISPR-Cas9 to differentiate between the different strains. And we showed you could do this marvelously with lab samples. Of note, for many here, I'm sure, interested in CRISPR-Cas9, we could freeze dry the CRISPR components without loss of activity. And intriguingly, for reasons we do not understand, the freeze drying for many of the enzymes increased their nuclease activity. Now in my lab, we carry these little freeze dried pellets of Cas9 CRISPR that we sprinkle on any of our paper submissions, hoping it automatically <laughs> gets into nature science cell, even if it has nothing to do with CRISPR Cas9. So where are we going with this? So now as we touch a little bit into potential cancer applications, I have three brief anecdotes to finish on. One is with support from a new microbiome center here at MIT, the Center for Microbiome Informatics and Therapeutics. We've been charged with developing a platform to look at the microbiome. And why relevant here is that, as uh, many appreciate, there's an increase in growing appreciation that the microbiome plays a role in cancer, both uh, initiation and progression. Here we did it looking at the gut microbiome. So the notion was, could you use the paper-based platform to quickly assay what's happening inside the microbiome and how it's changing? And with Melissa Takahashi leading the charge, what we've been able to do is now develop a panel of sensors that can look at about a dozen different bacterial species from a stool sample with high specificity. So we both target 16S rRNA, and we've actually used bioinformatic approaches to look at species-specific mRNA. And we can now use this to quantify the presence of the bug, in this case now, in about an hour to two hours as an output. Again, pennies per sensor. In an effort that we've just initiated in the last year with Sangeeta, uh, Aaron Dye, a PhD student in my lab, is now also using the platform to go after HPV. And we're doing this in collaboration with a hospital in Haiti. And the notion is, can we use this platform to develop a rapid, inexpensive test for HPV as part of cervical screening? And so as many of you appreciate that there are a number of HPVs uh, that are now problematic from a cancer standpoint, and then there is a small number that are. And so could one use a test that in a matter of minutes, preferably while the person who's maybe made a long trek across the country before they head home to actually get the diagnosis? And what Aaron, in a matter of just a, a few months, has been able to develop is now a number of different RNA toehole sensors that can actually be used to differentiate what strain is present. The specificity is not there yet, but we're hopeful within the next year we'll be able to get a platform that will be valuable. What I end with is a really new, exciting platform that I think is a marvelous example of convergence. And this is a, another CRISPR platform that we developed in collaboration with Fung Zhang's lab here at the Broden at MIT. And Fung's team reached out to us after we presented our work on CRISPR-Cas9. And they said they were thinking and planning to use this new Cas enzyme, C2C2, which is renamed Cas13A, as part of a diagnostic platform. So Cas13A is interesting in that it both targets RNA versus DNA, and when activated by finding its appropriate sequence, it actually has what they call collateral activity. So it doesn't simply degrade what it was targeting, it degrades RNA in its area. So Fung and Omar and Jonathan, two very talented students in his team, came and they had the notion that they, we could actually use this then as the basis for detecting any number of different sequences in clinical samples. And the notion here is now instead of using LAC-Z, it was a very clever floor four reporter system. What we have here now is a floor four that's quenched uh, by a quencher that's linked by an RNA element. So that if you now have this present with your CRISPR-Cas13A component, if once that gets activated, it'll chop up that RNA, release the floor four, and you get a readout. What we've been able to show with the team is we could use this to identify bacterial samples, differentiate between species. We can identify Zika. 
We can identify any viral scheme. Interestingly, without amplification, this system's already in the low femtomolar. So 10 to the minus 15, which is relevant for many, many clinical applications. And with 20 to 30 minutes amplification, we can get this to the atomolar, 10 to the minus 18, so down to a single molecule per microliter, which is basically limited detection for clinical schemes. In addition to the bacterial and viral schemes, what we were able to do was also show you could use this for rapid human genotyping. And that here, with just cheek swab, spit data, within about an hour, we could, in a targeted basis, so you wouldn't necessarily use this for discovery, but if you know what you're looking for, we could actually identify SNP differences. And kind of picking up on Tyler's, if we're going to think about tracking the course of uh, disease and or really identifying what treatments might work, this could end up being a valuable platform for identifying those with certain mutations. Here we show we could actually use this to get after SNP differences, mutations in cancer-relevant genes. But one could also envision using this to quickly look at what is the response of the cells in the patient to certain uh, drug treatments as a quick way, as uh, again, it was a marvelous panel before, as, as our insight into how uh, we respond to these drugs grows, I, we're going to need these fast readouts that are inexpensive. And so with that, I, I really want to just acknowledge the team of higher organisms here captured whose work that I got to share with you and, and who, uh, whose creativity I got to benefit from. Thank you.